Bharatiya Chhatra Samsad, a body of Indian student parliament. I see the future parliament here. I congratulate the organizers here, Mr. Karat Saab and others, for a wonderful, uh, you know, getting all these students from all over India. I'm told that uh, there are students from 28, uh, uh, you know, states uh, from all over India. Well, the topic is too relevant. And we have none other than Dr. Rajendra Kumar Pachori to give you the keynote address. Well, the topic is, is it too late to save the planet Earth? For whom enough is too little, nothing is ever enough. The world started without the man and will end without the man. The planet Earth is about 13.4 billion years. Yes, 13.4 billion years. And the human life arrived on this Earth long after the Earth was formed. Just about 4.6 million years. Now the sun will run out of fusion fuel in about 5 billion years from now and will turn into a red giant before sequencing itself to death. The earth will be cannibalized by the rapidly distending sun or will simply be blown up by expanding pressure. In such a situation, life is impossible. Life on earth has survived global level mass extinctions. In fact, life has taken it as an opportunity for evolution of forms which are able to survive. That's the Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest. Homo sapiens may become extinct, but other intelligent life will take the position and take over the human legacy. The global industrialization has brought global warming and destruction of the environment, while economic globalization has brought global recession. The future is bleak. The contemporary task of humankind is daunting. If necessary, course corrections are not made. Now, the earth will be brought to its ruin. Now, but the question is, are we even supposed to save the planet? For all we know, this may have just been the meant to happen. And we see only speeding along the line. There, not even a, there may not be even a way out. No, I'm not trying to scare anybody. But we have to see the possibilities. Hopefully, I am not. Maybe that there is no way out of this, but this is uh, the turning point. The life on the planet is estimated to be roughly 4.5 billion years old. Yes, 4.5 billion years. And we have been keeping the weather records only for about 150 years. And that's a very liberal estimation. Now, why does no one seem to care that there can be, uh, there have been several ice ages that have come and gone, all before the invention of the combustion engine and the development of fossil fuels. Does it seem sane to predict what will happen in the next three years by studying the last hundred thousandth of a second? Thank you. Thank you very much. पहले तो मैं बहुत आभारी हूँ राहुल जी का उन्होंने ये मुझे मौका दिया आप लोग सबसे बात करने का आ, हमारा जो चैनल है उसका एक मुख्य उद्देश्य है जो मुख्य मैंडेट है वो ये है कि पार्लियामेंट को कैसे पब्लिक से कनेक्ट करते हैं पार्लियामेंट को पार्लियामेंट में जो होता है अंदर नीति निर्धारण या दिशा निर्धारण होता है लॉज बनाए जाते हैं वो पब्लिक तक कैसे पहुँचाएँ और जब ये छात्र संसद की बात हुई राहुल जी ने आके डिस्कस किया कि पहला पिछले साल पहला छात्र संसद हम ऑर्गेनाइज कर रहे हैं तो मैं बहुत खुश हुआ बहुत उत्साहित हुआ इस आइडिया से कि हम हमारा जो हमेशा एक प्रयास रहता है हम पार्लियामेंट को लोगों से जोड़े और यहाँ पे बात हो रही है यूथ को मोबिलाइज करने की यूथ को पार्लियामेंट लॉ मेकिंग की जो प्रक्रिया है उससे जोड़ने की 
और मैं बहुत आभारी हूँ कि आप लोग यहाँ पे आए और आप लोग ने इसमें पार्टिसिपेट किया बहुत उत्साहित हुआ आप लोग का उत्साह देख के और धन्यवाद देता हूँ विश्वनाथ कारट जी को और राहुल जी को कि उन्होंने इस, इस और प्रोग्राम को ऑर्गेनाइज किया थैंक यू Good afternoon, friends, and the honourable guests present on the dais. My topic is saving the planet. Is it too late? The world is busy discussing the economic crisis, but when will we start discussing about the ecological crisis? I am afraid to go out in the sun now because of the holes in our ozone layer. I am afraid to breathe the air now because I don't know what chemicals are in it. the earth is shrinking and sinking every day and we are busy singing why this kolavari di we belong to a proud culture where we worship the earth as our mother but now the use and abuse of the nature has become our culture for years we have vowed for the purity of the ganga river but now we have even polluted this river by dumping industrial and urban waste into it that i wonder if this river will even exist for our future generations to see we have spent around 12 trillion dollars on nuclear weapons which can kill the entire planet in just 30 minutes if we are not willing to spend trillions on saving the planet the way we have spent on war killing each other then we deserve to be vanished forever The greed of the few rich and wealthy people is killing the planet. They are oppressing the masses. They are manipulating the politicians and the policies, which led to the war of the oil and the environmental pollution. If America can spend billions on billions on wars in Afghanistan and Iran for oil, why can't they put the same amount of money, brains, time on inventing new technologies like solar, wind, geothermal, hydrogen? and why can't we create more jobs and make more money by selling installing and maintaining these zero emission technologies on every home building car trains and friends we never realize while we burn those fire crackers that how many small children would have burned their hands while making these fire crackers we never realize while driving that expensive car that the production of this car is also responsible and one of the reason behind melting glaciers we never realized while wasting sheets of papers that how many trees would have been cut to produce these papers and we won't stop stop wasting water till all the rivers dry this is the time wake up my friends we don't have all the time and all the solutions We don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. We don't know how to bring back the forest now a desert. We don't know how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. And if we don't know how to fix it, let's stop breaking it. Let's start preserving our natural resources and be more responsible to save the planet. Let's promise to ourselves that we will be more caring. sensible respectful and more passionate to save the planet and the future of humanity thank you good afternoon everyone there's a huge cry about global warming emission cuts and saving the planet huge conferences are being held where world leaders from different nations are meeting up to see what we can do to save the planet and will humanity survive the 21st century but have we really pinpointed the actual causes behind all of this three broad causative factors are there first the power generation second the meat industry and third the vehicular traffic i am not going to talk about the first and the third causes today what i will talk may be politically incorrect but it has a huge impact on the environment today let's talk about the meat industry Do you know that the meat industry alone causes 40% more global warming than the entire vehicular traffic on the planet? 
This means that if you bring the entire vehicular traffic right now to a standstill, stop traveling altogether, and continue to eat meat, you would still be causing 40% more global warming. This happens because all this livestock that we raise, all these factory farms, these pigs and cows and turkeys and hens for meat, they need food for the animals. So many of our rainforests are being cut so that something can grow there which can feed the livestock. In addition to this, animals like cows and buffaloes, during their burping and releasing of wastes, they release gases like methane, which are potent greenhouse. Three to four people can eat a fully fattened chicken, I assume. Do you know how much grain a chicken eats during its lifetime? Almost 30 kilos. 150 to 200 people can eat 30 kilos of grain as a one-time meal, let's say rice. So each time you choose a vegetarian meal over a non-vegetarian meal, you're feeding, let's say, 50 people, which is substantial. <laughs> you know, the world leaders today know exactly what to do, but they're not doing it. Mr. Al Gore, who got the Nobel Peace Prize for Environment along with Mr. Pachori himself, even in his inconvenient truth, he doesn't mention this factor because probably it is too inconvenient for him as well. The head of the Global Security Institute at the Nobel Laureates Conference in Norway made the statement that the answer to this question can only be spiritual in nature. And I tell you, what India or what the world needs today is a group of spiritually empowered people. I tell you, I feel, I believe, very, very deeply I believe, that if many, 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 many people learn to meditate and meditate, you know, most of our problems will be solved. Because a person who meditates, by definition, is a non-frustrated, non-angry person. And when one such non-frustrated, non-angry person makes a decision, the probability of it being good is very high. And what we need today is many, many more such people to come together, to be together, to act together. So, here comes our personal choice, our opinion on the basis of our informed choices. Are we going to take a stand against this, or are we going to let our planet get raped? This is a place where we have to make a choice. We have to come together. You know, it is only the Indian youth that can do this, because in our country, we have this culture of spirituality. We have this culture of belongingness, of oneness. We have this unity in diversity, which is rare, which is appreciable, which is phenomenal. So here we have to make a pledge. We have to take a wow. You know, I have Mr. Pachori himself backing me up on this point, let me tell you. You know, we have to promise ourselves that I will educate, let's say, 100 people about the ills of the non rich food. You know? And when this message gets spread, I tell you, a substantial change will happen. You know? It really is not too late. You know, I, I really don't understand the topic. Why do we have to include the phrase, is it too late? Is anything too late for the Indian youth? Do you think so? Yeah. We can always, you know, we've been like that all through the ages, you know. We've always taken, you know, be it positive or negative a statement, actions at the extreme situations. And it has worked out well for us. So I would say that, you know, go vegetarian, adopt it, be green. This is exactly how we can save the planet. This is the only way, I tell you. <laughs> Jai Hind, Jai Gurdjieff. Professor Vishwanath D. Karad, Sri Rahul Karad, distinguished leaders sitting on the stage, and young people present over here, the promise and hope of tomorrow. I think the question that we're trying to answer today is truly pertinent. Before I came here, I would have given you an equivocal answer. I would have said, yes, we might be able to save the planet if we do so and so, but if we don't, then we may not be able to save the planet. But I can tell you, coming here, 
looking at this multitude of young people, listening to the inspiring words spoken by two of your young representatives fills my heart and my mind with hope and aspiration. So we will and we must save the planet. But how are we going to do it? And as you've heard, it is India that must lead the way. Because as your young colleague mentioned a while ago, we not only have the power of youth in this country, do remember there has never been a single society throughout the history of human society when we have had such a large number of young people full of hope, full of aspirations, and full of values. That's one essential ingredient for bringing about change in the right direction. The second reason, which was also pointed out, is the fact that this is a land of spirituality and the dominance of the spirit. And I think what you need in combination with all this is knowledge. And that's essentially going to be the theme of what I'm going to try and present before you. It was Einstein who said, problems cannot be solved with the level of awareness that created them. Therefore, we need to raise the level of awareness. It's also been said, Professor Vishwanath Karad was telling me a while ago that this will be the century of India. It will be the century of India as it will be the century of knowledge. And divorced of knowledge, it cannot be the century of India. And when we talk of knowledge, we are talking essentially not only about science and technology, we are talking about the arts, we are talking about philosophy, and most importantly, we are talking about spiritual enlightenment. So what is it that we must do to bring about a change in the right direction? Well, let me first deal with the issue of climate change, which is clearly the biggest challenge that we are facing as the human race. Climate change has been caused, as Einstein rightly indicated, not specifically in this case, but in general. It's been caused essentially by a lack of awareness. It's not as though people didn't worry about climate change earlier on. As a matter of fact, there was a well-known Swedish scientist by the name of Arrhenius, who at the end of the 19th century, after solving a large number of equations manually, came up with the finding that if we are going to use more and more coal, if we are going to produce more and more carbon dioxide through combustion, we are obviously going to cause a serious problem in terms of affecting the climate of this planet. Well, he wasn't listened to. Several others after him weren't listened to. And it was only towards the end of the 20th century that several voices of enlightened persons, of scientists, and some leading thinkers and leaders, even of political uh, parties, started raising the fear that perhaps human actions are affecting the climate of this planet. And that's when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was established way back in 1988. And it was charged with the responsibility of carrying out a comprehensive assessment of climate change so that the world could be informed about the scientific realities associated with climate change. And we have been in existence now, this body has been in existence for 21 years. And I want to, I want to highlight for you, I'm sorry, my maths is a little wrong. We're in 2012 now. So we've been in existence, in existence since 1988, and we were set up towards the end of 1988. What I want to say is that this represents an example of how science can be mingled with public policy, which is not without its hazards, which is not without all kinds of hurdles that come in the way. Because you must remember, there are those who would resist change. There, there are those who would be inconvenienced by change. And therefore, 
as has been the case throughout the history of knowledge, whenever something new comes up by way of knowledge, by way of scientific information, there's a small section of society that will question it, some for very genuine reasons, and science must welcome that, because science can only thrive, science can only grow if it is questioned. If you take it as accepted without questioning, then I think it becomes blind faith. It doesn't represent the acceptance of human beliefs. But there are, of course, those who would oppose knowledge because it is inconvenient to them, because they feel that it challenges the status quo and it challenges the benefits that people would get as a result of continua continuation with status quo. Now, I just want to inform you, since all of you are here, that we really need to start a major movement all over the world which has to be driven by knowledge and acceptance of knowledge. Now, in the case of the IPCC, I can tell you, we mobilize the best scientists from all over the world. One of them is here, Professor Madhav Gadgil. He has contributed enormously to the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I want to tell you, these are scientists who are devoting their time without payment from the IPCC. It is a labor of love. It is a sense of pride. It is a sense of contributing to the future of humanity which drives them. And we work together. We work over several years to produce a report. And at each stage of the production of a draft, it is subjected to peer review by expert reviewers. These expert reviewers, reviewers give us a set of comments. We post these on the website. The authors decide which comment is to be accepted and which one is not to be accepted. But the ones that are not accepted, you have to give reasons why it's not accepted. I'm mentioning all this only because there has been a substantial amount of disinformation to say that the IPCC functions inside some kind of a closed room. But you have the best scientists in the world. Do you think they would be motivated to do something which is biased, which is not objective, which is not rooted in the truth and in the scientific reality? I also want to mention that, you know, when we choose scientists for the IPCC, we write to all the governments of the world and they send us the CVs with the list of publications, the research track record of each of the scientists, and then we choose them. For the fifth assessment report, which is currently in hand, we had over 3,000 nominations. And it's very difficult to choose from these 3,000. However, we selected 831, and they are working together. By 2014, we would have completed the fifth assessment report. Now, I've mentioned all this because I want you to know about some of the major findings of the work of the IPCC. And why is it that all of you, to secure the future that you're going to face, your children are going to face, must get involved in doing something about this major challenge? Well, we firstly said in the fourth assessment report that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. When we use the word unequivocal, it means that there is no basis at all for questioning this. And what we have stated is on the basis of actual records. We have temperatures collected from all over the globe, going back till the beginning of industrialization, and we now know for sure that this planet is warming. But it is not a smooth, steady, linear increase in temperature. What we are doing is we are really uh, influencing, we are affecting every parameter, every part of the climate of this globe. We also said very clearly that most of the warming that has taken place since the middle of the last century is the result of increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases which have been caused by human actions, anthropogenic concentration of greenhouse gases. And when we use the term very likely, we are assigning a probability of over 90%. Now you tell me, 
when you can assign a probability of 90% to something which can be corrected through actions as your colleague just told us a while ago and he focused just one on one of them the meat cycle in the in the world but there are several other things that we can do given the fact that it's a 90% probability or more should we not be taking action and another reason why we must take action is because the impacts of climate change are now being found to be progressively negative we just brought out two months ago a special report on extreme events and disaster and how we might be able to advance adaptation to these extreme events and I just want to mention two important findings for your consideration we have found and we have projected that heat waves are on the increase in frequency and intensity and those heat waves which currently take place once in 20 years will by the end of the century occur once in two years what are we going to do what are the poor going to do who are exposed to the elements day in and day out whose work is out in the field how are they going to cope with this in increased frequency and intensity of heat waves we will have to find means by which we adapt and that's not going to be easy that's probably going to be very expensive another major finding is the reality that extreme precipitation events are on the increase what does that mean well what it means is that you will get large quantities of precipitation it could be snow it could be rainfall in a very short period of time I was watching television this morning and they said that in Alaska they have had more snowfall in a very short period of time than has been the case throughout the winter in previous years you know very well in the city of Mumbai in 2005 we had a massive cloud burst which not only paralyzed the city but it took away a lot of lives it damaged a lot of infrastructure and buildings so these are the kinds of occurrences and I'm not saying that any of these two items was the result of human induced climate change but occurrences of this type are going to become much more commonplace much more frequent and much more intense we also know that the impacts of climate change on agriculture are going to be negative overall there are a large number of farmers in this country in this very state who are dependent on rain fed agriculture and they are really not producing large surpluses for selling in the market they are producing this basically to keep body and soul together they are producing this for their own needs to consume and to be able to live now if their output is going to be affected how are they going to cope in the case of Africa we have projected that as early as 2020 there are some countries in Africa that will see a decline in agricultural productivity of over 50 percent on account of climate change and climate variability now these again are poor farmers who are producing just about enough to take care of their own needs if they see a decline of 50 percent or more in their output what are they going to do where are they going to go we have also projected that as early as 2020 in Africa there will be 75 to 250 million people who would be living in a state of water stress on account of climate change and as it is they have large areas and large numbers affected by water stress so this builds into this projection the possibility of conflict the possibility of groups fighting against each other because they cannot possibly survive without water they cannot survive without food and therefore there are major social implications from climate change that we cannot ignore we cannot be immune to and we cannot shut our eyes to what can we do well we need to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases we've got to stabilize the concentration of these gases in the earth's atmosphere how do we bring that about there are lots of things that we can do in our daily lives that can make a difference but unless the world as a whole 
and unless you can arouse the world as a whole starts doing something that is tangible that is adequate and that is timely we will not be able to solve this problem what we really need therefore is a plan a determination and a sense of optimism by which we bring about a shift to a much lower fossil fuel intensive pattern of development we also have to protect our forests deforestation is a major source of emissions of greenhouse gases we need to change our lifestyles because if our lifestyles are very intensive in the use of carbon based fossil fuels then clearly we are not going to be able to solve this problem i want to tell you something which perhaps is not very well known you know there are a large number of opportunities that the world has for reducing emissions of greenhouse gases which can actually be achieved at negative cost in other words if you were to take those measures you would actually save money and i can tell you in very simple terms many of our buildings are very inefficient in the use of energy those of you who come to new delhi please get in touch with me i'll show you our terry retreat complex which uses no power from the grid and is a, it's as comfortable as the best uh, five star hotel that you can go to although there's no comparison between the two we don't believe in that all right the terry university which is located in new delhi is highly energy efficient and we have done this as an act of charity we have done it because you save money and therefore there are these win win opportunities there are means by which we can easily implement negative cost measures that will save money in terms of whoever is responsible for these measures it will save money for consumers who would be able to pay a much lower amount and get the same comforts the same goods and services that they would get otherwise and what is the total amount that's available to the world for such negative cost measures you would be surprised by 2030 we can reduce 6 gigatons of co2 equivalent of these emissions if we implemented all these negative cost measures why are they not being implemented they are not being implemented because there are vested interests that will not allow these to be implemented they are being they are being ignored largely because society has become ignorant we don't question everything that let's say the developed world has done and we just copy it and follow it blindly that's not going to lead us anywhere it will lead us to ruin similar to what mahatma gandhi rightly said and i have said this several times but i'll repeat it for the information of the young people over here gandhi ji was asked i think by a british journalist mr gandhi don't you want india to reach the same level of prosperity as britain and his answer was it required britain to use half the resources of this planet to reach its level of prosperity he said how many planets will india require how many planets will india require we have our own country we are part of this planet we cannot get the resources of any other planet so let us try to carve out a path of development let us try to set an example and create a model for the rest of the world by which everybody says if there is a society that develops sustainably with full appreciation of and full respect given to the concept of sustainable development it is indian society and that's where the opportunities are in your hands it's very easy for you to follow what the rest of the world has done but in doing so you're making your own future much harder so my young friends my plea to you would be that we have to make sure that we bring about security of energy supply in this country and one reason quite apart from the problem of climate change that we must move towards greater use of renewable energy much more efficient use of all sources of energy is because we have to bring about security of energy supply in this country we are on a path whereby 
In another 20 years, we would be importing over 750 million tons of oil and we would be importing 1300 million tons of coal. Can this country afford this? Can this country even be able to achieve such a large quantity of imports from the rest of the world? That's certainly not going to happen. So therefore, what we really need to do is to use our knowledge of the future, use our knowledge of how we can tackle this problem and start moving in a direction that's a sharp departure from what we have been doing in the past, what the world has been doing in the past. So therefore, what I would say is there has to be a clamor for much more efficient building design and construction. There has to be a clamor for more efficient public transport. There has to be a clamor for more efficient motor cars. There has to be a clamor for using bicycles and walking whenever you can so that you are healthier and so is the planet. And therefore, I would say that we need to look at everything out of the box. We cannot take anything for granted. You have the power of youth. You have the intellectual capability to start looking at development in its very essence. What is the purpose of development? The purpose is to bring about an improvement of the human condition. And the human condition is not purely a physical or a, or a mental condition. The human condition is also a spiritual condition. And I think it is for you to start harnessing knowledge, start developing technology, start coming up with demands of your leaders by which you get a set of choices that would take you to a sustainable future. And I think there is time to save the planet. But if we delay it much longer, it might really be too late. Let me end with a little anecdote. There was this story of two planets crossing each other in the universe. And one planet asks the other, how are things with the universe? And this planet says, well, things are all right. But I'm a little worried about that planet called Earth. So he says, why, why are you worried about planet Earth? He says, I'm worried because that, there's that species called human beings that lives over there. So the other planet says, well, don't worry, they're not going to last very long. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, we are studying uh, environmental science from our school days. But it was only for the getting the grades. Uh, neither the students or teachers took it seriously. And the students don't get uh, aware about the problems related to environment. So can we, can there be a compulsory project at university levels uh, which will increase the participation of students? And can we make compulsory tree plantation mandate? Well, let me say, I think compulsion doesn't really work in the long run. I would say the students have to take voluntary action. My submission and my advice would be for you to band together, get together, and say we are going to do something. And if you start doing something, I can assure you it will snowball. You can do that in your schools, in your institutions, in your colleges. You can also do it in the localities where you live. And I can tell you that will be a far more powerful effect than making anything compulsory or using any kind of force or coercion. As a human being, the people who are in the world are in the world. Sir, if you are in the world, you are in the world. Sir, I can tell you that the people who are in the world are in the world. Sir, what are you seeing today? ये जितने कंक्रीटाइजेशन हुए हैं सरों के सर यहाँ पे जरूर कुछ समय पहले दस साल पहले बीस साल पहले कुछ पेड़ पौधे रहे होंगे इतना सर पृथ्वी को बिना सोचे समझे रिसोर्सेज का इतना दोहन किया जा रहा है कंक्रीटाइजेशन किया जा रहा है सर हमारी अभी डेवलपमेंट की सबसे बड़ी आवश्यकता है एनर्जी जिसको पूरा करने के लिए सर एटोमिक का बहुत ज्यादा यूज किया जा रहा है अगर एटोमिक एनर्जी का हम यूज कर रहे हैं तो इसका वेस्ट हम सर धरती के किस कोने फेंके कि धरती मां बची रहे
ये ये जो आपने प्रश्न उठाया बहुत अच्छा प्रश्न है तो मैं आपसे ये कहूँगा कि सबसे पहले तो हमें विकास का अर्थ जो है वो समझना चाहिए विकास का अर्थ केवल यही नहीं है कि आप ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा खपत करते जाएं कंजम्पन एंड प्रोडक्शन ऑफ मोर एंड मोर गुड्स एंड सर्विसेज वो विकास नहीं है विकास का अर्थ जो है वो आपको निकालना होगा और मैं आपके साथ सहमत हूँ कि अब जैसे परमाणु ऊर्जा है हम अगर उसको लागू करना चाहते हैं उसमें परियोजना बनाना चाहते हैं तो हमें उसका उसके जो रिस्क हैं जो उससे खतरे हो सकते हैं उनके ऊपर पूरा संतोष होना चाहिए कि हम इसको संभाल पाएंगे यदि किसी समाज में कमी है कि वो संभाल नहीं पाए तो उसको परमाणु ऊर्जा का इस्तेमाल नहीं करना चाहिए और जो आप कह रहे हैं कि जितनी पहाड़ हैं वो नष्ट हो रहे हैं जगह जगह जो पेड़ हैं वो कट रहे हैं जो जंगल है उसमें वाइल्ड लाइफ खत्म हो रही है इससे मुझे गांधी जी की एक बात याद आती है उनसे पूछा गया कि गांधी जी व्हाट डू यू थिंक ऑफ वाइल्ड लाइफ इन दिस कंट्री हिज आंसर वाज वाइल्ड वाइल्ड लाइफ इज डिक्लाइनिंग इन द जंगल्स बट इट्स ग्रोइंग इन द सिटीज noted environmentalist honorable dr rajendra pachauri ji and prabhudev ji madhav gadgil ji dheeraj singh ji goen swarup ji dr vishwanath karad ji and my dear friend rahul karad ji it gives me a great pleasure to be amongst you students from 28 states i think it's monumental and this effort taken by the organizers simply superb our planet is in great danger as over the years we have wasted and misused the natural resources of mother earth and the results are there to see volcanoes in japan tsunami in the andamans and the far east flash floods in thailand earthquakes in various parts of the world global warming climate changes acid rains droughts melting glaciers and other forms of natural catastrophes still out of our control remain oil spills hazardous waste loss of loss of rainforest municipal waste crisis pollution and the depleting ozone layer i was shocked to read an advertisement in a national daily a couple of days back issued by a state government inviting industrialists to invest in the state and explore natural resources and minerals which are which are abundant in the state whereas in usa or any other developing country which has abundant resources the oil they need for their requirements is sourced from other countries or they rely on alternate energy we have to follow the 3 r's reduce reuse and recycle a small example would be school and public libraries books can be borrowed and read returned instead of purchasing a copy reuse of books by all of us can save a million trees similarly taking buses or using car pools instead of individual vehicles which not only saves fuel but also reduces traffic and air pollution it is you who are the future of our great country let us all join hands and work together in protecting the environment and saving our future our planet for our future generations jai hind first of all i thank every one of you for this opportunity kele aur kel side hai and uh, i'm so happy that uh, mit has arranged this wonderful summit for future political leaders we are at an important fork in the history of india 
Never before in the last 300 years did we get much respect from the outside world, nor was there much expectation about us in the outside world. This is the first time that the world expect us to do well, to, to lead the global economy and to lead the recovery. I see tremendous confidence amongst youngsters wherever I go. I must admit that I did not have that level of confidence when I was your age. There are many reasons for this confidence. One, our GDP is the second fastest growing GDP in the world. Our foreign direct investment is the second largest foreign direct investment in the world. Our software industry has become well known and indeed we are called the software factory of the world. We send a large number of students outside India for higher studies. We are now part of G20 and we are consulted on most economic matters. Therefore, this is a moment that comes rarely in the history of a, our nation. At the same time, we have another India which is not as fortunate as the first India. We have more than 350 million people who earn just 36 rupees per day according to the planning commission. Therefore, that leaves very little money for education, health care and shelter for a family of five. We have the largest massive illiterates in the world, about 400 million people. We have over 250 million people who do not have access to safe drinking water. We have over 750 million Indians who do not have access to decent sanitation. Half the schools in rural India have just one teacher for every two sections. We are considered low on productivity, in governance, in transparency and in competitiveness. The need of the day therefore is to bring excellence, efficiency, equity and most importantly execution focus to our policies. That is where I believe that the future politicians and leaders that are all assembled out there in Pune will become key to the success of this nation in fulfilling the dreams of the founding fathers. What is it that you can do to indeed fulfill the dreams of the founding father? First, you have to lead by example in everything you do. In honesty, in uh, being proactive, in uh, being courteous, in uh, shunning apathy, in showing solidarity with nation, in making sacrifices, etc, etc. Second, you have to create an environment of openness to new ideas no matter where they come from. They may come from within India, they may come from outside India. They may come from the rich people, they may come from the poor people, it doesn't matter. You have to ensure that you raise about the constraints of religion, caste, gender, race and party affiliations in embracing such ideas that indeed improve the, the, the country. You also have to educate yourselves to become productive politicians and to good for the country. Therefore, please study fundamentals of advances in governance, in developmental economics, in international trade, in exports, in role of technology in improving the lives of the poor, 
in international negotiations and in entrepreneurship. Ponder over the role of the government in the development of a nation. You also have to be secular because in the task of building the nation, we want every Indian to participate with full enthusiasm and energy. We cannot let the 20% of the people who belong to minority religions in this country not be part of this wonderful journey. We want everybody to be enthusiastic. We want everybody to participate in making this a better country. You have to be fair in every transaction and you have to follow the golden rule. What is the golden rule? Do unto others what you want them to do unto you. They, this raises the confidence of people working with you in teams. You have to use data and facts in every argument and debate. Such an approach will bring out the best decisions and will, will eliminate biases and raise the confidence of people in your leadership. You cannot become emotional and discourteous in discussions. The whole country will be watching you in your debates in the legislatures or in the parliament. Therefore, you have to become role models of decent behavior and courtesy uh, while disagreeing with other people. You also have to remember that you will become the role models for the next generation. Therefore, you have to follow the principle that one can disagree with others as long as one is not disagreeable. That is extremely important. What distinguishes civilized society, civilized people from not so civilized people is the integrity of thought. And that is whether you are in the government or in the opposition, you have to stand on issues based on logic, data and facts. You cannot say one thing today when you are in government and exactly opposite when you are in the opposition. Above all, please remember that a civilized society is one where each generation will work hard and will make all the necessary sacrifice to ensure that the next generation of, of uh, children and people are better off than the current generation. As future legislators and parliamentarians, I am sure you will become exemplary leaders of this society. I am extremely thankful to you all for this opportunity of speaking to you people. I, I wish I had been present there in person. Unfortunately, uh, I had to be in Bangalore because we had a very important function on 9th and 10th. So, uh, so therefore, please excuse me once again, and I'm very, very happy to have been given this opportunity. Saving the planet, is it too late? We, the student leaders assembled here in the second Bhartiya Chhatra Sansad, hereby resolve and appeal to the government to formulate suitable rules and regulations so that the biodiversity rich regions and fragile eco ecological regions do not fall under the ambit of land acquisition.